Good evening and welcome to RASC Toronto Centre Online. I'm Ralph Chu, the President of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre, and it's my pleasant duty to introduce tonight's uh, program. Uh, tonight we have a special uh, lecture presentation. Uh, it's one of the two types of meetings that we have during the uh, year between September and May and uh, I'll talk about our other types of meetings later on during the announcements. Uh, we were supposed to hear tonight from Dr. Camille Marson of the, of the York University. Unfortunately, she was unable to uh, uh, carry through with her commitment to us and we'll have to look forward to hearing her at another time. Uh, in her place, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our second vice president, Paul Delaney, uh, who is going to give the talk instead. Paul is uh, no stranger to giving talks to the RASC, and he's certainly no stranger to the Canadian public when it comes to astronomy. Uh, since he joined York University's Department of Physics and Astronomy in 1986, he has become a frequent uh, uh, guest commentator on uh, both CBC and CTV, and global uh, talking about astronomical events and uh, also now as university professor and director of the Allen I. Carswell Astronomical Observatory at York, uh, he is uh, bringing uh, astronomy to the internet uh, with twice a week uh, YouTube streams from uh, the Carswell Observatory. Uh, he has been a member of the RASC since 1980, and uh, he has uh, served as our second vice president for programs since 2009. Uh, his reputation as an astronomical educator and communicator has been recognized in many ways, uh, beginning with the 2010 Sanford Fleming Medal of the Royal Canadian Institute, uh, and then the 2015 Keelock Award of the Canadian Astronomical Society. And in 2017, he received the Klumpke Roberts Award from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific uh, for his uh, work in astronomical outreach. Uh, and as you will shortly hear, uh, he is a great uh, communicator of scientific ideas of all sorts. Uh, tonight, he's going to be speaking to us on uh, the topic of water in the universe. And so I'll invite uh, Paul to uh, give his talk, Water, Water Everywhere. Paul? Thank you very much, Ralph, for that uh, terrific introduction. Timing is everything. Earlier this week, of course, NASA made a very important announcement with respect to water on the moon. They must have known I was going to be talking to the RESC Toronto Centre tonight for uh, that timing. Uh, we'll touch on that uh, commentary from NASA a little bit later on. But uh, you know, water is one of those topics which has really become an important topic uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. We've always been exploring the idea of water in its variety of forms, ice, liquid, as well as water vapor, uh, in all corners, literally, of the universe. But it has taken on increasing importance over the last little while as we begin to look towards the exploration, the human exploration of the moon and Mars in particular, and of course, exoplanetary endeavors. So it is really an important topic. And I'd like to share that with you tonight, give you a little bit of a, a feel for the, uh, the commonality of water, if you will, particularly in our solar system. So before we go any further, I do need to uh, reiterate a little bit about what Ralph just indicated. The Alan I. Carswell Observatory at York University has many opportunities for people to engage us. And even though you can't be up there in person with us because of the pandemic, you have the opportunities on Monday and Wednesday evenings with our radio broadcast, York Universe, and with our Teletube, that's sort of like Telescope YouTube, on Wednesday evenings. No, don't go anywhere at the moment, but uh, on other Wednesday nights when uh, you're not tuning in to the RESC Toronto Centre, by all means pop across to uh, YouTube and dial up the Alan I. Carswell Observatory. And of course, you can check us out uh, anytime thereafter. If it's not live, uh, we do archive that. So there's lots of opportunities for you to engage with York University and uh, astronomy in general. 
At some point, of course, we will have the opportunity to bring you back onto campus. We have 40, 60 and 100 centimetre telescopes. The one metre telescope, of course, is our pride and joy. It's transmitting live images on Wednesday evenings. Uh, of course, Mars has been taking centre stage. The moon is always wonderful, Jupiter and Saturn. Those objects have really been the mainstays for the last uh, three or four weeks. But of course, uh, as the year progresses and we move into uh, open cluster season, galaxy season, lots of wonderful objects uh, at a one meter telescope does wonderful <laughs> things for your viewing pleasure. So by all means, keep an eye on us uh, electronically, but uh, once we are in a position to bring you back onto campus, make the pilgrimage up to York University. It's well worth the effort. Okay, well, the simple question, where is the water? Why should we care? really boils down to a question of life. As almost everybody listening tonight is aware, NASA has followed the theme of follow the water to try and appreciate whether or not life on Mars, for example, once existed, still exists. Water is a key ingredient with respect to life. Here on Earth, it would not be possible to have the variety of life, the diversity of life, the biomass that inhabits our planet without the abundance of water that we so enjoy. So if we are talking about exploring the universe, looking at exoplanets around other stars, looking at you know, galaxies in general, to be able to understand the dominance, the importance of water, how to find it, those all talk to us about a better understanding of astrobiology, of the search for life. Well, water comes in three differing phases, solid, liquid, and gas. They're all water. We refer to solid water as ice. We refer to uh, gaseous water as water vapor. Uh, when we say water, most people immediately think of liquid, but in reality, water can come in any of those three phases. The chemical makeup of water, H2O, two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. Well, you might be sitting there going, why is water so common? And think that perhaps it shouldn't be as common as it actually is. But if you step back for a moment and think about all the elements that exist in the universe, the 92 elements that make up the periodic table, hydrogen is the simplest of all elements. It has one proton and one electron. Yes, it has differing isotopes. And so on. we're not going to get carried away with that. But generally speaking, hydrogen is one proton and one electron. It's the simplest, most common element in the universe, bar none. Apart from helium, the second most abundant, the third most abundant element in the universe is in fact oxygen. So if you've got a lot of oxygen, and you've got hydrogen literally in great abundance, it shouldn't surprise you that two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen get together to form water. So this molecule, H2O, really is very, very abundant based upon literally the chemical abundances of elements in the universe as a whole. Where does H2O get made? Because it's one thing to have hydrogen. It's another to have oxygen. Where does the oxygen come from? The hydrogen came from the Big Bang. Where does the oxygen come from? Literally stellar nucleosynthesis. When we talk about stars and stellar evolution, the more massive stars are where we are able to generate oxygen. And of course, there is no shortage of big stars, large stars, massive stars in our galaxy, in the universe as a whole. And of course, those stars don't live for a particularly long period of time, meaning that they can recycle their stellar envelopes, the material from which they are made very, very easily. This is the periodic table, probably not quite the way you remember it from high school, but generally speaking, you can see at a glance how the differing elements in our universe came into being. And this is actually a bit of a, an intro to our speaker come November, Dr. Uh, Daniel uh, Siegel from the Perimeter Institute. He's going to be talking about how gold is made and those elements that are generated out of the merger of black holes, neutron stars, and the like. Anyway, let him tell you that story in November. For us, have a look over there at oxygen. It's in the sort of the top right-hand corner. And you see that 
that particular element is generated in the more massive stars. Our sun is sort of a low mass star. So we're talking about stars that are four or five solar masses or more, four or five times the mass of our sun at least, and larger, meaning that the nucleosynthesis process, the process of generating heavier elements than hydrogen and helium, happens relatively easily in these stars, and oxygen is formed in this manner. So hydrogen and oxygen, quite abundant elements in the universe. They get together in the right environment in deep space to form H2O. Now, as I said, you know, we can look to finding water in all sorts of places. Our galaxy is big. The universe is big. And I only have 40 minutes. So we're going to stay confined to our solar system in our own backyard, if you will. And we're going to have a look at where we have found water amongst the planets, the comets, the asteroids in our own solar system. But I hasten to add that when we're talking about water and its prevalence, it really is everywhere. We find it inside giant molecular clouds, dust and gas clouds between the stars. We find it, we found evidence of water present in the envelopes of exoplanets. So don't think for a moment that our solar system has the market cornered on water. It does not. Well, of course, we're all very, very familiar with water here on Earth. A quick image of our own planet reveals a plentiful amount of water. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. And on average, we're talking about five kilometers deep is the oceans of our planet. Yes, around the coast, it's much thinner uh, and, you know, you certainly have to go out into the middle of the oceans to get to those sorts of depths. But think of our planet, you know, 12,500 kilometers in diameter, the top five kilometers-ish on average is water. Sounds a lot of water, but actually it's not nearly as much as you think when you think of the mass of our planet as a whole. The moment you go below that five kilometers, sort of that meniscus of water, on our planetary surface, the hydrosphere, you're now talking about the rocky interior of our planet. And we're talking about sort of low density rocks, silicate rocks near the surface, grading down to the heavier metals in the core of our planet. The five kilometers or so thin meniscus of water around our planet really isn't that much. But obviously we've got more than enough to generate the huge diversity of life that we find on our planet. We find that life not only on the continents, like you and me and animals and birds and mosquitoes, not to mention all those microbes, but in fact, the biomass, the biodiversity of life beneath the ocean is huge, absolutely huge. And so when you're looking at water on our planet, you realize immediately that it is the key molecule when we start talking about the development of life. Without water, the biodiversity on this planet would probably amount to zero. So water is key to finding life. How did the water on Earth actually get here? It sounds a simple question. Unfortunately, it does not have a simple answer. For the longest time, astronomers were of the view that water came from the interior of our planet, that is to say from the solar nebula. And as our planet formed, water in the form of ices was trapped in, if you will, the, the body of our planet as it accreted, as it collected more material together. And then as our planet began to cool and solidify, literally the volatile materials like water vapor were being squeezed out of the planetary interior, popping out through cracks in the planetary surface, out through volcanoes, and steadily our atmosphere built up from a lot of this trapped volatile materials. And then as the planetary surface cooled, give or take a bit, five to 600 million years after our formation, the temperature was cool enough, the atmosphere was thick enough that the water vapor began to distill out, to condense out to form our oceans. Undoubtedly, a lot of our water, well, I shouldn't necessarily say a lot, a fraction of our water, what that fraction is, we don't know, but a fraction of the water in our oceans did in fact form through this condensation process, but not nearly enough of it. The models of our planet, an appreciation, a better appreciation of the pre-solar nebula from which our planet formed, suggests that 
we could not have trapped a sufficient amount of water vapor, ices, within our interior to generate the liquid water of our oceans that we see on our planet today. What other sources could we have tapped to generate the amount of water we have on our planet? The short answer is asteroids and comets. The leftover material from the formation of our solar system, and rest assured, there was lots of stuff lying around after the planets formed. In fact, in the sort of three and a half billion year ago era, there was what we referred to as the late heavy bombardment, where our planet literally got pummeled continuously by leftover cometary debris, asteroidal material, uh, helped along, if you will, by the Jovian gravitational field. Literally, the inner solar system had lots and lots of rocks being thrown at it, and the Earth hmm, got in the way. Asteroidal material, cometary material, rich in volatiles. And we believe that they carried a significant amount of water into our planetary environment. Now, there's a fairly simple way to test that hypothesis. When we actually get a sample of water from our oceans and our lakes, there is a quantity called the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. Hydrogen, you recall, is the simplest element in the universe. It marries up with oxygen for H2O, water. But there is an isotope of hydrogen, that is to say, hydrogen's nucleus, which contains one proton, it must contain one proton to be called hydrogen, sometimes can have a neutron in there with it. So the nucleus has two nucleon particles, a proton and a neutron. That's what we refer to as an isotope. It's still hydrogen, but it's subtly different. It's a little heavier. It's a little more massive than regular hydrogen. Obviously, they, this, this isotope of hydrogen can marry up with oxygen to form not so much H2O, but D2O, because heavy hydrogen is referred to as deuterium. If we measure the D to H ratio in our water, then it is a characteristic signature of our environment because of course water evaporates and the lighter water will evaporate more easily than the heavy water, the D2O. So looking at the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in a particular environment will give us insight into that particular planetary signature. So it's like a thumbprint for that planet. Comets have that same D to H ratio. And so the argument goes, if we measure that D to H ratio in cometary ices, then if that D to H ratio for the cometary material matches the Earth, then we can be fairly confident that the ices from the comets were being delivered to Earth to increase our water reservoir. Well, like most questions in astronomy, there is no clear cut answer. Some of the comets out there actually have the D to H ratio that we want. And obviously, some of the water on our planet has, in fact, come from cometary impacts, asteroidal impacts over the four and a half billion years that we've existed. But not all comets, not all asteroids have that same D to H ratio. So the question is still under a very active discussion. Planetary outgassing, the condensation of water vapor that has come from our interior to create oceans, definitely that is a contributing process for the water on our planet. Cometary asteroidal impact on our planet, absolutely a contributing factor for the water on our planet. But what those two ratios are, we actually don't know. And was there another mechanism that uh, you know, came into play with respect to the water on our planet? Okay. Comets, of course, we all know about. You all saw that wonderful comet, Neowise, in July. It's very evident with the tails that that streaming material from the comet's nucleus is, in fact, a mixture of volatile materials, including water vapor, as well as other things, carbon dioxide, ammonia. And, of course, there are two tails associated with the comet. The other one is the sort of particulate material because the cometary nucleus is being heated by the sun and literally the volatile material escapes in a very, very dramatic fashion, almost explodes out of the comet's nucleus and drives off a lot of dusty, rocky material. So these two beautiful tails can appear behind a comet, but it is the sort of the ion tail, the tail which is rich in those volatile materials, which tells us the D to H ratio associated with that particular comet. So it's pretty easy to measure the D to H ratio. 
It's even easier when we send spacecraft to go into orbit around comets. And that's what happened with the Rosetta spacecraft from the European Space Agency. It orbited Comet 67P, Churyumov, Gerasimenko, uh, oh, I guess, oh, gee, nearly two years ago now. Uh, and it gained a lot of insight into this sort of floating rubble pile, a, a, a rocky mix that had a lot of volatile materials, a lot of ice, barely held together gravitation. This is not a solid object. And it's important for us to understand these cometary uh, dynamics because, of course, not only are they potentially answering the question of water and its relationship to our planet and other objects in our solar system, but some of these objects have had the audacity <laughs> to plow into our planetary environment. And, of course, we need to understand how potentially we could protect ourselves from these types of uh, intruders, these interlopers. So studying comets has all sorts of both interesting scientific information, they were time capsules after all, from the formation of our solar system four and a half billion years ago, down to the notion of literally planetary defense. Bottom line to it is we know that these objects do bring water to our planetary environment. There's no shortage of them. <laughs> when you look out to the Kuiper Belt, which is sort of the area beyond Neptune, the trans-Neptunian area volume around our solar system, the location for the relatively short period comets, there are literally probably millions and millions of cometary nuclei out in that region. You look further afield out to as much as sort of 50,000 astronomical units. The astronomical unit is the distance the Earth is from the sun. So out to about 50,000 times the distance the Earth is from the sun, that is the Oort cloud. And that's full of truly billions of cometary nuclei that periodically get stirred up and rain towards the inner solar system. We pick up 20 to 30 new comets every single year. And we track these objects as they swing around the sun because that's when they develop their cometary tails and so on. That's when we're able to do our best science, if you will, when they are in this heating and outgassing phase. But the important point here is that there is no shortage of cometary material that could have transported water, not just to the Earth, but to all locations in our solar system over the four and a half billion year timescale that represents our planetary history. Okay, I said uh, earlier this week, NASA did me a favor and advertised the fact that they have now found definitive evidence for water on the moon, water ice on the moon. Even before the announcement this week, we knew that there were significant deposits of ice on the moon, particularly in the permanently shadowed areas around the North and South Pole, particularly the South Pole. It's more heavily cratered down there. Because of the axial inclination of the moon, as it both orbits on its axis around the Earth, as well as the Earth-Moon system moving around the Sun, there are regions on the polar areas of the moon, which literally never see the light of day. Yes, the surface of the moon rotates such that the surface is able to see sunlight at some point during its sort of you know, 28 day uh, rotation rate. But some of the deeper craters near the polar axis actually have deep, dark shadows being cast into them that never actually change. Here on Earth, shadowed regions still can be heated because of transport of energy by the air, the atmosphere, and it can warm up even permanently shadowed areas here on Earth. But on the moon, no atmosphere. As a consequence, a permanently shadowed area will stay really, really cold. And we're talking about potentially minus 150, minus 200 degrees Celsius, really, really cold. And the image on the right shows you some of those regions around the south pole of the moon, which based upon radar investigation, as well as imaging from a variety of spacecraft, suggest in no uncertain terms that there's a lot of water ice trapped permanently in an ice solid format near the poles. There has been lots of investigation over the decades, including the uh, original Apollo lunar samples, that suggested that there was some measure of water trapped in the lunar regolith, the soil of the moon, but not much. 2009, there was a very impressive uh, experiment 
called Elcross, where we literally plowed the third stage of a rocket into the moon and we followed the third stage in with a tiny little satellite that was bristling with instruments as the third stage plowed into the moon it threw up a huge plume of material from deep within the crater and the satellite that was following behind measured the composition we know that there is some measure of water trapped water ice trapped in the lunar regolith question is how much and we really don't know the answer to that, but we now have a much better idea based upon recent observations from the SOFIA Observatory. That's an infrared astronomy uh, telescope that flies in a modified 747 high above the Earth's atmosphere. It's been looking at the moon and using spectroscopy has identified absolutely the existence of water, not just the hydroxyl molecule OH, but really H2O, because those two molecules sometimes are really hard to differentiate. But the SOFIA observations clearly, categorically show the existence of water, H2O, trapped in the lunar regolith. And they're seeing it literally out in the open on the illuminated sunlit side of the moon, down near Clavius Crater, in fact, in particular, which is towards the southern latitudes, but nowhere near the South Pole. So there is a lot of water ice trapped in various parts of the moon. The regular, though, don't get too excited, don't start packing your swimsuits just yet. We're talking about potentially sort of like 12, 15 ounces worth of water in about a cubic meter of lunar regolith not what you call soaking, but nonetheless, the possibility exists that we might be able to extract that water on the lunar surface. And if we can extract that water, then it's less water that our astronauts don't have to carry to the moon. If we're talking about a permanent settlement on the moon, then being able to extract water from the lunar regolith without having to travel all the way to the South Pole really would be a big plus. In short order here, we have gone from thinking of the moon as being a very dry, barren place some 50, 60 years ago, to recognizing that there is a significant amount of ice present on the moon. Now, of course, when we look at the planets of our solar system, Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, its surface temperature is, well, give or take a bit, 400 degrees Celsius. Pretty balmy there no atmosphere. Nobody really thought to look for water there. But guess what? In exactly the same regions on Mercury near the South and North Poles, we find permanently shadowed areas there, just like we do on the Moon. Radar imaging from the Earth has confirmed the existence of either the hydroxyl molecule or water in these permanently shadowed areas. And based upon our experience with the Moon, most people are of the view that these signatures that we're picking up are of ice, literally H2O. And of course, we've got messenger imagery these days. Messenger was a spacecraft that orbited Mercury for about three years. The imagery there suggests, again, that the permanently shadowed areas of a crater, and we've got Kandinsky crater here being shown, is a great site to find lots and lots of ice. How that ice got there, was it through the outgassing process that I described for the Earth and Mercury early on? Did it have enough atmosphere that this uh, water could condense into the darkened areas? Maybe more likely that it was ice transported there by asteroidal and cometary impacts. And if you do it widespread enough across the planet, some of those impacts are going to occur in the permanently shadowed areas those craters that you can see here at the North and South Pole. So even in hot locations like Mercury, we are finding direct evidence of H2O ice. Next planet out from the sun, Venus. Okay, Venus is not a Club Med destination either. We're talking about planetary surfaces temperatures here of 450 degrees Celsius, hugely thick atmospheres, raining sulfuric acid. This is not a good spot to go and visit. Nonetheless, evidence suggests today that there is both water vapor trapped in the cloud decks associated with Venus and modeling 
suggests that maybe three billion years ago, when the atmosphere was less thick than it is now, but thicker than the Earth's atmosphere was at a comparable period of time, that the greenhouse effect was allowing sufficient water vapor to condense on the Venusian surface. We are seeing some signs of erosion on the surface, although not much because Venus is sufficiently active with lava flows and so on, that reading the surface signatures is very hard to do, especially given the fact that we can't get spacecraft to survive for more than an hour on the ground. But the evidence is pointing to an increasingly wet past for Venus. Not wet now. The surface cannot sustain water now. But there may well be trapped water ice beneath the surface. And there is certainly water vapor in the upper atmosphere of Venus. So when the sun was cooler in the past, the possibility, in fact, is now almost a probability that the Venusian surface had liquid water. As the situation in the Venusian atmosphere changed, so too did that water begin to dissipate in a variety of manners, but some of it might have literally formed underground and could still be there. So again, in really hot locations where you at least expect to find water, we believe water still can exist, but not on the planetary surface. Well, Mars is the poster child as far as water is concerned. Everybody wants to be able to see water on this particular planet. And there is no doubt in the world that Mars did once have a lot of water. Their ice caps are there these days. The signatures as far as erosion on the surface is concerned are there. All of our modeling suggests that Mars would have had a lot of water in the past. And I'm talking about potentially three and a half to four billion years ago when Mars was a lot younger, with a much thicker atmosphere, with a surface that was still modest in terms of its temperature, and it was able to sustain through the outgassing process water on its surface. So Mars on the right of this image, no question in the world, we're talking about a serious amount of water on the planetary surface. But Mars has gone through a lot of changes and today the image on the left shows you a dusty desert-like environment. Lots of signs of erosion in the past, ice caps that you can see there below, but today with only 1% of its atmosphere present, we're not talking about an environment that is able to sustain liquid water. There are clouds in the atmosphere there, and those clouds do contain water vapor. It can't rain on Mars because of the low pressure. And of course, the temperature is pretty darn chilly, but it doesn't change the fact that the Martian atmosphere does contain clouds, not dissimilar to what we see here on Earth. The last 50 years of spacecraft investigation of this planet have revealed all sorts of telltale signs. On the left, you see what appear to be eroded channels associated with presumably flowing water, the same sorts of pictures that we would see here on Earth. On the right-hand side, you can see sort of an animated GIF, several images of the same region on the surface of Mars taken throughout the course of a day. And you see it going from sort of a dry, dusty appearance to what appears to be a wetter appearance. And that wetter appearance, the darker appearance that we're seeing there, we are interpreting as the action of salts. Salts with upper layers of ice, which at the height of the day, temperatures potentially reaching up to zero degrees Celsius. But when you're talking about a lot of salt, associated with ice, as all of us Canadians know, you can generate liquid water. So if we were, want ice on our roads to be minimized, we throw down lots and lots of salt, and that salt lowers the freezing point of water. That's what we think we see happening here in many parts of the Martian surface, that there is sufficient salt content, and we can see the salts spectroscopically, we know what those salts are. We also know that there's lots of ice subsurface to the Martian surfaces, and therefore the combination of those at the right temperature during the day generates literally damp areas on the surface.
So Mars has got lots and lots of ice all over. This is an image, a uh, radar image basically, from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter around the North Polar region of Mars. And you can see literally sheets of ice subsurface stretching out for literally dozens, in fact, hundreds of kilometers from the pole itself with varying thicknesses of ice. We've, we can see ice in the polar ice caps. We can see it with our radar. We see evidence of past irrigation, not irrigation, <laughs> erosion channels on the planetary surface. So Mars was once a very wet environment. We wanted to go down to be certain of that ice, and we sent a spacecraft there in 2007-8. It was the Phoenix mission. It landed about 30 degrees latitude south of the North Pole, actually closer than that, 20 degrees south of the North Pole. And the plan was to look at the surface environment and, of course, to do lots of atmospheric measurements as well. Well, they literally found ice the moment they landed. The retro rockets that allowed Phoenix to land safely uh, blew the surface soil away, and we realized that Phoenix had come to rest on huge tundra ice sheets, just what we had hoped to find, and we found it immediately. And of course, the robotic arm was able to scoop into that. We were able to bring some of that material onto the spacecraft. And in the process, we were able to measure the pH. It's right there within the range of human tolerance. It's run of the mill, everyday, regular water. Those clouds that I was mentioning, well, we monitored them from the Phoenix landing site. And those clouds, actually, we recognized were generating water ice falling from them. Literally, it was snowing in the North Polar region above the Phoenix lander. Given the fact that this was a Canadian built instrument, the weather station was built here in Toronto, principally at Optech. We were using LIDAR to monitor the atmospheric composition. Here you see some of that imagery here. You can see the cloud up there at about three and a half, four kilometers. And the streamers that were coming out were literally snowflakes. Now, it doesn't land on the ground. Don't pack your skis yet. This is not that amount of snow. But the process that forms snow here on Earth is forming snow in the cloud decks of Mars. It seemed fairly fitting that uh, Canadians measure snow on Mars. We went down with the most recent, almost uh, the most recent rover to the surface of Mars, Curiosity. We landed it in Gale Crater. Gale Crater, we believe, was once a Martian lake bed. And the plan for the Curiosity rover was to run around Gale Crater to find more definitive evidence of both standing water as well as flowing water. Went down in 2012, August of 2012, and you can see some of the imagery here. The top right-hand images, in fact, are the first images from Gale Crater by Curiosity. But in the intervening time, we have found ample evidence, again, of flowing water, of stationary bodies of water, so lakes as well as streams. And now Curiosity is doing its impression of a mountain goat. It's climbing Mount Sharp, which is a five-kilometer-tall mountain peak in the very center of Gale Crater. It's up around about three quarters of a kilometer at this point in time. All the while investigating the variety of differing types of soil and rock which existed in this lake bed on the surface of Mars. You're probably asking why did Mars change? Well the short answer to that is that as Mars was cooling, being a smaller object than the Earth, it's about half the diameter, it cooled quicker. It had less heat trapped within it. And, of course, again, being smaller, the overlying rock layers were thinner. Those rock layers here on Earth act as a really great insulator, and that keeps our internal heat quite well trapped. So we have leftover heat of formation trapped in and around our liquid outer core of our planet. That coupled with its composition gives rise to a magnetic field. The magnetosphere of the earth arises literally from the liquid nature of our outer core. And it's retained its liquid nature because of our size, our physical size. Mars was not so lucky. At half the size, 
by about three and a half billion years ago, we think the liquid outer core had solidified. The heat had dissipated outwards. The insulating value of the Martian rock was not nearly as high. And as a consequence, the interior solidified. And as it solidified, the Martian magnetosphere, the magnetic field that protected the Martian atmosphere from literally the sandblasting activity of our solar wind, that protection disappeared. And slowly over the millennia, over the billions of years, the Martian atmosphere was eroded away. The atmospheric pressure dropped, the liquid water that existed on the planetary surface had to evaporate. Some of that water vapor became photo disintegrated by the energy from the sun. The hydrogen disappeared. Some of the oxygen did remain in the atmosphere. Some of the oxygen was retained by the surface and, of course, gave rise to iron oxide, the reddish color on Mars. But in general, what was once a hospitable environment has now become a desert-like environment. We can actually still measure the erosive power of the solar wind on Mars's current atmosphere, and we do that in real time with another NASA spacecraft by the name of MAVEN. What we had on Mars was a very wet environment. In fact, it was more hospitable, more habitable even than Earth probably at the same era in time, that is to say four billion years ago. Again, because it was so much smaller, it became more hospitable quicker. Lots of water then, not nearly as much water now, but a significant fraction of that liquid water probably has been retained by the planet in the form of permafrost, ice scattered across the surface. So again, if you're keeping track, all of the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and the Moon, all had ample supplies of water almost from the get-go in the early moments of the solar system's formation. As we cross the asteroid belt, no surprises here. The largest asteroids that we've been able to investigate, Vesta and Ceres, yes, Ceres is now a dwarf planet, but I keep calling it an asteroid. It's got multiple names. But Vesta, about 500 kilometers across. Ceres, about 1,000 kilometers across, just a little bit under. Both visited by NASA's Dawn spacecraft. Both of these objects are quite ancient, but both of them are showing significant signs of water ice trapped beneath their surface. In fact, when you have a look at Ceres, you see those two little bright white spots there. They are surface salts in Ocata Crater. Surface salts exist on both of these objects. Sometimes we find them in greater deposits like we did with the Ocata Crater, but there is no shortage of salts on these two objects. As a consequence of that, we are of the view that subsurface ice can in fact mix with these salts and you got it, the possibility of dampening the surface, generating sort of, you know, almost moist patches all over these asteroids is quite possible. In fact, in some of the craters on Ceres, we actually saw fog at differing parts of the day. They cannot sustain water on the surface. They cannot sustain fog and so on. We're not talking about atmospheres here to speak of, but nonetheless, under the right heating conditions with the right surface conditions, AKA salt and ice, we think that there are substantial amounts of subsurface ice that periodically make it to the surface to give us the insights to these environments. And so again, you're looking at these two objects, Vesta on the left, Ceres on the right. These are images taken with the gamma ray and neutron detector instruments on board the uh, Dawn spacecraft, sensitive to either H2O or OH, the hydroxyl molecule or the hydroxyl radical, as well as the water molecule. Can't differentiate between the two, but again, based upon all of the evidence we're finding elsewhere in the solar system, it's highly likely that the grand instrument is in fact detecting mostly water, water in the form of ice. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, Mars, larger objects in the asteroid belt. We're all familiar with Europa, one of the larger Galilean satellites orbiting around Jupiter, a surface that is 100% 
ice. We found that out with the Voyager spacecraft back in the late 1970s. We're seeing movable surface. We're talking about a pliable surface, which seems to be experiencing subsurface melting, which is changing the ice structure on top. That subsurface heating, of course, is a result of tidal heating from Jupiter, the gravitational field of Jupiter literally needing Europa as it orbits around Jupiter. And uh, with a little bit of help from the other Galilean satellites, you end up with a bit of a tug of war taking place in the interior, which gives a lot of heat. And that heat is obviously melting subsurface ice and generating a liquid interior inside Europa. In fact, Europa's liquid interior may well surpass by many a factor the amount of water that is on Earth. We don't know how deep the water is inside Europa, but there is speculation that it is literally 50 to 100 kilometers thick, given the fact that this is an object that's about 3,000-ish three and a half thousand kilometers in diameter, the amount of liquid water inside Europa, and it's warm water, far surpasses the amount of water of the Earth's oceans. We even have seen with the Hubble Space Telescope image on the right here, some of that water being expelled out through the surface cracks. So the watery environment associated with Europa is very, very significant. It's not the only satellite that has a water interior. It's certainly the largest in terms of uh, the volume of water, but even Ganymede, the largest satellite in our solar system, based upon a measurement of its inherent magnetic field, tells us that there is a subsurface conducting layer. And here you see a model that can accurately reflect what we are observing with the magnetic field, a significant tens of kilometers thick layer of salty water. And again, Ganymede doesn't have quite the same level of internal heating, tidal heating that Europa does, but it certainly is significant, again, driving the internal dynamics that give rise to, as I said, the magnetic field. So water inside the larger satellites of the Jovian system. We go out to Saturn. We're not going to talk about Titan, but Titan has subsurface ice as well, although it has a whole lot more uh, liquid methane on its surface, as well as raining ammonia. But when we tripped over with the Cassini mission, the satellite Enceladus, about 400 kilometers in diameter, we found a series of really interesting near parallel stripes at the southern area, the south polar area of Enceladus. It was nicknamed Tiger Stripes. And those tiger stripes seem to be vents that allowed for water to be literally expelled from the interior of Enceladus out into Saturnian orbit. And you see here several of those geysers. This is real imagery from the Cassini mission. The modeling of what we're detecting, and it was water, by the way, because Cassini flew through it and analyzed that it, it's salt water. Those water reservoirs inside, we think, represent you know, literally a hundred kilometer diameter cavern of water, and it gets squeezed out courtesy again of the tidal forces that Saturn is able to exert on Enceladus. So big satellites like Europa, Ganymede, they are three, four, five thousand kilometers in diameter. The smaller satellites like Enceladus, only 400 kilometers in diameter, all of them have significant quantities of water. And in this instance, we're talking about water in a liquid form, not just in ice forms, as we have seen Mars, the moon, Mercury. Here, we're seeing it in its liquid form. So all throughout our solar system, water is common. We once thought that Earth was the only place in our solar system where any significant amount of water existed. And of course, water has given rise to a huge amount of biodiversity, a huge amount of life on our planet. We now realize that water is not nearly as uh, scarce in other locations of our solar system as we once thought. The terrestrial planets riddled with ice. We're talking about the satellites of the outer solar system riddled with liquid water, the asteroids, the dwarf planets. Water is truly everywhere in our solar system. And by inference, we would expect water to be as commonly located 
in exoplanetary environments, planets orbiting other stars. So next time you take a glass of water, think about comets and think about the commonality of H2O in our universe. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul, for that really fascinating uh, talk about water in our solar system. Uh, at this point, uh, I think we have uh, some questions from the audience online. So I'll call on Blake. I think it's Blake who's handling it tonight. So, yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to take those questions away and let's see where uh, what the uh, questions are from our audience. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, first question for you, Paul, is from Eric. Um, he, he was wondering what the... Uh, water or water ice in the moon is hidden in. He uh, likened it to silica beads, like in those do not eat silica packs. Um, are, are they absorbing the moisture on the moon? So in the areas that are in the open areas, the sun-drenched areas of the moon, so based upon the uh, observations that were reported earlier this week from NASA, it's actually a darn good question. We're not 100% sure how the water is staying trapped in the lunar regolith. There are lots of theories out there that the water... Uh, molecule is trapped inside the beads as he is suggesting that they are maybe sandwiched inside rock matrix and the rock matrix is protecting the water from the harsh sunlight and the uh, photo disintegration from ultraviolet radiation but to be perfectly honest at this moment in time we're not 100 percent sure how the water vapor sorry the water ice is being retained in the lunar soil Obviously, when you're talking about the soil temperatures reaching sort of 100 degrees Celsius, you would think that the water would evaporate out. Obviously, that's not the case because we're talking about the moon having survived for four and a half billion years ish, and we're detecting water scattered across the surface, not just in isolated areas. So there must be a mechanism uh, uh, that is taking the ice embedding it with the lunar regolith in such a way that truly the water molecules are being not only trapped, but protected from the harsher environments. In the lunar craters, it's easier to understand. You grab a comet, slam it into the moon surface. If the crater is deep enough and it's at the right position near the North or South Pole, then sunlight really can't get at it to evaporate or sublime more to the point, because of course it can't form liquid, but go from solid to gas in the lunar environment so the cratered areas that's much easier to understand they're just deep enough that they're permanently shattered no direct irradiation from the sun and with no conductive capability with a non-existent atmosphere the water ice survives as ice and so arguably we should be able to go into those craters and literally dig up huge quantities of ice for future use but of course getting into those craters is a lot tougher especially if it's sort of half a kilometer down, going down, digging up the ice, bringing it back up, that's going to be a huge challenge. If we can find mechanisms to extract the water, the ice that is trapped in the lunar regolith, much easier for us to work with. But there's not nearly as much of it, we don't think. Okay, thank you. L Lou, uh, in the YouTube chat, referred to the probe coming back to Earth. The, which has been in the news lately, of course, the uh, Cyrus Rex. Yep. Are we expecting to find some water uh, uh, that's on the Bennu asteroid? Absolutely. No question in the world. Uh, Asteroids tend not to be as water-filled or water-rich as comets. Comets really, in fact, that's really the difference between comets and asteroids. Comets have a significant quantity of volatile materials trapped within their matrix, whereas asteroids do not. So the asteroids, if you will, have dried out <laughs> over time or formed in an environment that was not nearly as ice-rich. Nonetheless, we know that asteroids do have trapped ice. How much? We don't know. But will there be traces of ice within the rock material that Osiris-Rex has picked up? Absolutely guaranteed. 
what will its D to H ratio be? That will be an interesting question. Uh, but how much of it, uh, nobody really knows the answer to that at this point in time. But it looks as if we might have picked up maybe a kilogram or more of material. I mean, it was a fabulous pickup there last week, uh, but we won't know the answer to the full composition of uh, Bennu until that rock stuff returns to the uh, Utah desert in 2023. But yes, there will be ice in there. That'll be pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, a question from me, uh, have you read, this is borderline on topic, have you read Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Where they throw rocks back at Earth? Yes, that was a very neat, <laughs> neat story back. I read that a long time ago, Blake. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I remember uh, uh, sort of a key element in that is that the moon had significant water resources that the Earth wanted. I think uh, I think what we can take from Heinlein speculation because that that uh, book was probably written in the 40s or the 50s I can't quite remember which but it would have been of that era at that point in time we really did not know what the moon's composition was most people uh, were of the view that it was a very dry environment because of course you know all of the detections from Earth spectroscopically suggested that it was just a rocky outcrop, despite the fact that it's the sea of tranquility, the sea of storms, and so on and so forth. All that was misnomer from you know, astronomers not knowing what the composition of the moon was 400 years ago. But back when Heinlein was writing that story, I guess he speculated that subsurface ice could well exist on the lunar surface or beneath the lunar surface. And, you know, water being an important characteristic, uh, sending it back here to Earth. Bit of a stretch, but, you know, that's what science fiction is all about. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, Cicely asks um, uh, the, about the Mars polar caps. They're, they're made of H2O. They're made of CO2. She pointed out that CO2 has a, a lower, a much lower uh, evaporation point than water. So how do we know that the clouds that we see are made of, of water, of H2? So you're absolutely right. The uh, ice caps on Mars have a permanent cap, which is basically CO2. But in the depths of winter, we also end up with uh, H2O there as well. And so there is a mix. Uh, we are able to determine the clouds uh, of water vapor. Basically, again, it's, it's spectroscopy. We're, we're able to analyze the composition of those clouds, and it is H2O. We've now done LIDAR measurements in the atmosphere, and again, it's primarily H2O. There is not sufficient atmosphere there to create really thick clouds like we see here on Earth, let alone thunderstorms and so on. But uh, there is, in fact, a surprising amount of thin, wispy cloud that goes through the same sort of diurnal cycles uh, as we see here on Earth. Uh, but the overall lack of water that can be evaporated into the uh, atmosphere or ice that can be evaporated into the atmosphere keeps the overall cloud content down. But the short answer is spectroscopy and LIDAR have told us the composition of those clouds. Okay, very good. I, I stumbled across a fascinating infographic um, a couple of months ago, and you touched on some of these points that Enceladus has water, Europa has water, Ganymede, but I was fascinated to see the ratio, the, excuse me, the ratio of water compared to the Earth, that if you took all the water on the Earth and balled it up, made one sphere and hold that up against the earth. It's quite small. And Europa, Pluto, I was surprised by that, Triton, Callisto, Titan, and Ganymede all have much larger volumes of water. So my question to you is, should there not be some, if we're going to follow that, that or observe that mantra, follow the water, it should should we not be directing a lot of effort at exploring these worlds? 
The short answer is yes, uh, we, we should be doing more for some of these uh, other locations, but it does come back down to money. Uh, yes, the, the Earth's water, while it looks huge and the oceans are vast and so on, the, it's meniscus thin compared to the diameter of our planet. As I said, you know, about five kilometers thick. If you take that as an average uh, for the 70% of the surface area, do the volume calculation and then compare it to Europa in particular, where we think that we're talking about 50 to 100 kilometers uh, you know, thick of water and uh, so on. The amount of water there is just stupendously larger than it is here on Earth. But getting to that water is really tough. We, we don't know whether or not there's a five kilometer or 10 kilometer thick ice shelf that represents the, the crust of Europa. Drilling through that is a non-trivial exercise. And so, you know, while there's a lot of missions that are being proposed to go out there, the Europa Clipper, the Icy Moon Survey Probes, and so on and so forth, to be able to actually get at the liquid water in Europa is really tough. And ditto for Callisto and Ganymede. Um, you know, out to Enceladus, well, we've been to Saturn just once in the last, you know, uh, what is it, uh, 40 years. That was the Cassini probe, and that took seven years to get there. And so these places are far more remote, if you will, than Mars. Mars is an easy target. Uh, you know, Venus is a relatively easy target. And as I said, there's been a lot more interest in going back to Venus, not just because of water in recent years or recent months in particular. So getting out to Jupiter, getting out to Saturn, let alone getting out to Pluto, really, really hard to do and very expensive. So you're not going to see nearly the same level of assault on those objects as you see on Mars partially because Mars is a lot closer. Mars has got a lot more possibilities, if you will, for settlements. Uh, you're not about to go and settle on Europa. So Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, those other objects in our solar system, scientific interest, really, really important scientific interest. But Mars has that added key for the idea of settlement and people going and walking on the surface. So you're going to continue to see a lot more interest in the follow the water mantra on Mars than those other objects. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I don't, I'd go to Mars, but I don't know if I'd go to a moon <laughs> of uh, Jupiter. Um, uh, Willermo asked um, if we have a hundred kilometer deep ocean on Europa, the pressures on that deep sea are hard to imagine what physical oddities uh, uh, do scientists expect under such extreme pressures? <laughs> Isn't that a good question? Uh, I guess the short answer is I really don't know. Uh, it's speculation. Uh, that volume of water, even in the reduced gravitational field associated with Europa, remember, it, it is a much smaller object. It is a much less massive object. Uh, and so, you know, like the moon, its surface gravity is only one sixth of the Earth. But yeah, you put 100 uh, kilometers of water above you and it's going to be quite some pressure. Uh, so I, I don't know. I haven't uh, read very much uh, with respect to what they're really expecting in there. The questions <clears throat> that have been studied more along the lines of the, the salinity that we're expecting there. What can we actually, uh, how can we actually probe that interior with actually, without actually getting into the interior? What will we be able to read from the surface changes that might inform us about what's happening in the interior? But um, in terms of what you would find on the, the ocean floor, if I can use that term in Europa, I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. It um, it it does evoke though the the research that's being done with extremophiles on Earth, and to me that's fascinating. We know that there's vibrant uh, biology that seems to be quite comfortable in these extreme pressures, um, a highly saline environment, and no light. So it, it does beg the question if there would be similar sort of possibilities in uh, some of these ice-covered but water-based worlds. Absolutely. When we look down at our own ocean floor near these sort of black smoking volcanoes, 
ample levels of energy, phenomenal pressures, as you say, no photosynthesis, completely dark, but chemically rich. The biomass, the biodiversity that exists on our ocean floors is stunning. Extremophiles have shown us in no uncertain terms that life will flourish in really challenging environments. And that's one of the main reasons everybody gets very excited when we talk about Europa. It is a lot of water based upon the, the, the saline salt content that we're seeing on the surface. We would expect that to transmit into the ocean itself. It's warm water, courtesy of the tidal action from Jupiter. So you would think just, you know, you know, off the top of your head that the conditions in the European ocean must be conducive to life. That, that doesn't mean that there is life there. We've not got any indication that there is life there. But when we look at the surface of Europa, we find evidence of tholins on the surface. So long chain carbon molecules, not life, but long chain carbon molecules. So the Europa environment is one that is really, really exciting to contemplate. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Cynthia asks, uh, why is tetragonal ice, I hope I said that right, uh, why is there tetragonal ice versus hexagonal ice on Callisto? Don't know is the short answer. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not enough of a chemist uh, to know. Uh, I, I will you know, take a guess that when we're talking about on the surface of Callisto, uh, the gravitational environment, the surface composition in terms of how much ice is there, uh, the pressure that might be put on it by the tidal action with Jupiter, all could give rise to differing physical constructs associated with ice. But I really don't know. So I'm, I'm not going to waffle. <laughs> it's not an area that I am particularly familiar with. Heck, I like looking at stars. I mean, Callisto is really cold by comparison. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. All right. No worries. Uh... Uh, Louis asked, uh, uh, will future missions like the James Webb Space Telescope uh, make the detection of water on exoplanets more certain? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the James Webb Telescope, when it gets launched, uh, has a six meter diameter dish. Uh, it has a, uh, it's sensitive at the infrared area. Uh, of the spectrum, the expectations of James Webb for doing in-depth, detailed analysis of exoplanetary environments, you know, it just makes the mouth water. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of expectation around what James Webb is going to be able to do to revolutionize our understanding of truly planetary environments. I mean, we're uh, exoplanetary environments. We're really be expecting to be able to give you weather reports to detect the amount, the level of water vapor, the amount of cloud that should exist in these uh, environments. And if there are biomarkers to be found spectroscopically, we really do expect for the closer exoplanets, like within 100 light years of us, that James Webb is going to give us unparalleled insights into their current environmental condition. So yes, we're looking forward to what James Webb will be able to do for our understanding of exoplanetary environments. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm looking for any other questions I missed in the chat. I don't see any. Uh, uh, I have one more thought, but it's not well formed. Um, I, I was thinking about our world and that it's really a water world, uh, as you say, 70% covered and so on. But most of that is saline. And from a human perspective, that's not good. Um, but there's, a, there's a, an extraordinary number of creatures that are quite comfortable in that environment. So it, is saline a factor? Um, I, I don't know if that's a good question by itself, but, but, you know, I think when we talk about the discovery of water on worlds, people are thinking of drinking water, but we're not strictly talking about that, right? No, we're not. Uh, when you, when you've got to be careful that uh, when you start thinking about other environments, exoplanets, water, the presence of water, you don't look at that with the lens of could humans 
survive it. You know, water is a precursor to all forms of life on our planet. And as we've said in a couple of the questions here, those life forms vary dramatically, even on our own planet. So if you've got a planetary environment that is or is not rich in saline, depending upon the type of life that is forming there, it is highly likely that the life will adapt to the environment that exists there. And so if there is a uh, preponderance of, quote, fresh water that you and I want, then the life forms that will initially form will probably gravitate towards, you know, utilizing that form of water and not care so much about the absence of, of salts. And conversely, if you've got a very salty environment, which is going to be the more likely environment, forming salts uh, in, in the presence of water, in the presence of all of the, the rocky substrates, forming salts is pretty common in that regard. So it is more likely that you're going to be generating environments that have salt uh, and saline levels that may or may not be comparable to Earth. Life in all likelihood will develop. I mean, we develop life through our oceans here, yet you and I dislike salt water. So, you know, biodiversity exists even on this planet. No reason to think that biodiversity won't exist on differing planets, regardless of the level, the pH level that the water find, that we find in the water. So we'll follow the water salt or not. You got it. Thank you very much. That's it for questions. Okay, great. Well, I, I would like to thank Paul for that really fascinating uh, talk on uh, water. Uh, it's certainly uh, uh, a very, very important aspect to uh, finding life. And uh, we certainly had a lot of really good questions tonight about uh, uh, water and uh, what we need in order to find life in the universe. So again, thank you very much, Paul, for that uh, talk. So uh, we've come to the end of our uh, formal program tonight. Uh, the only other thing that we need to do now is to queue up the announcements to uh, just let you know what is uh, in the works for the next couple of weeks. And it'll just take me a moment to uh, put my slides up uh, onto the uh, board. So uh, I think we've got the slides ready and I'm just going to check with the uh, production crew to see whether they are ready. Are we ready for the uh, announcements? So I'm not hearing anything. Ready. Okay, great. Go ahead. All right. So uh, let's take a look at um, what's uh, in store for the next uh, a couple of weeks. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do have two different types of meetings uh, that we hold online. Uh, and hopefully when we are able to meet face to face, we'll do the same kind of thing. Uh, the next uh, uh, online session is going to be a recreational astronomy night hosted by Paul Markov. And that'll be on the evening of uh, Wednesday, uh, November 11th, Remembrance Day. Uh, that program. Uh, so far we have Dennis Gray uh, presenting the sky this month and Wayne Parker will hopefully be able to uh, finally uh, give his presentation on sky shed and beyond. Uh, uh, some of you may remember that uh, two weeks ago Wayne was supposed to uh, give his talk at the, uh, the uh, uh, well, four weeks ago rather. Uh, uh, he was supposed to give his talk in September, but uh, at the last minute he was called away um, uh, on business and had to uh, drop out of the uh, program for that particular session. So we've got him signed up for next time around on Wednesday, November 11th to uh, talk about uh, what is going on with Skyshed, the pods and pod max. We do have one open slot for that evening. So uh, this is an invitation. Uh, if anybody has a talk uh, or would like to give a talk uh, of between 20 and 30 minutes, perhaps, uh, please contact Paul Markov uh, to let him know that uh, you're available and he'll be happy to slot you in. And in fact, this is an open invitation uh, that uh, if you do have a talk that you would like to present uh, at a recreational astronomy night, 
please contact Paul and he'll be happy to uh, you know, chat about when you can uh, do your presentation. Uh, we're just starting to put together the calendar for uh, uh, meetings, um, online sessions, if you will, uh, for 2021. So um, very, very soon we will have uh, those dates crystallized and we'll be able to schedule you in. Uh, our next speaker's night uh, is going to be online for sure. And um, at uh, the evening of uh, November 25th, uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Daniel Siegel, who is affiliated with the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo. Uh, Dr. Siegel um, is um, going to be talking about how to make gold, astrophysically speaking. And um, uh, this is a topic which is of great interest because uh, when we start looking at how the heavy elements uh, on the per uh, periodic table are uh, synthesized uh, uh, in stellar cores and in supernova explosions and so on, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, uncertainties about how certain elements get uh, put together and, uh, and when. And so uh, Dr. Siegel is going to be talking about uh, the latest uh, theory on um, how uh, these heavier elements are, are synthesized. That talk will uh, end at approximately uh, 8.30 and we'll have the usual questions. And after that, we will be uh, signing off and reconvening on Zoom for the annual meeting of the Toronto Centre. Um, and this will be the session when we uh, give our uh, reports on uh, the finances and uh, uh, all of the things that have happened in the Toronto Centre uh, in the uh, fiscal year that uh, uh, began on October the 1st, uh, 2019 and ended uh, this uh, 30th of September. And um, this is your chance to uh, find out about how the Centre operates and how our finances are. Now, because of the fact that we are using our Zoom account uh, and we need to find out how many people are intending to uh, participate in the meeting because we do have uh, a limit on um, our current account, uh, we are asking you to pre-register for that meeting. Uh, I sent a MailChimp announcement uh, about the annual meeting to you by email uh, at the beginning of the week. And we also have that announcement on the Toronto Centre website uh, in the members only pages. So you can find information about how to register uh, for the meeting. When you do register, uh, you will be given uh, a return email message with the uh, meeting information. And then at the conclusion of the speaker's night program on the 25th, if you then exit YouTube and then uh, just click on the uh, uh, URL that you've been provided, uh, you can join either through the Zoom software uh, uh, on your phone or on your computer, or you can join uh, uh, through a web browser uh, to connect with the meeting. And um, we anticipate the meeting will probably last about an hour to get through everything. Uh, we do need to have uh, uh, at least 25 people participating in order for uh, uh, the uh, various bits of business to be done uh, for that meeting. So again, please take a look and register uh, for the uh, annual meeting. Uh, again, one of the problems that we have with the pandemic, uh, with the second wave that's come back, uh, or has arisen rather, in the GTA is that uh, we are limiting our education and outreach activities as well as our observing activities to virtual star parties uh, for the most part. Uh, and individual members have been going out to our various uh, observing venues uh, to try and uh, uh, connect up and do some observing at uh, uh, you know, safe physically uh, distant spacing. 
and, and that's great. But um, you know, the uh, problem remains that uh, a lot of our regular activities are suspended until the end of the pandemic emergency. So uh, we do have virtual star parties that are going on as part of our EPO. Uh, we are starting to uh, get uh, requests from uh, scouts and guide groups. So all uh, levels uh, within those organizations from uh, Sparks and uh, uh, Cubs uh, through uh, the guides and uh, scouts and into the pathfinders and venturers for presentations. So, um, you know, one of the things I would ask is if, if you have experience in doing uh, any of these kinds of presentations um, uh, before the pandemic shut things down, uh, we could really use your help in uh, doing some of these presentations as the requests come in because uh, uh, Ian Quillband and the others who have been doing these presentations can only do so much. And there is a huge demand out there. Uh, certainly we know that there's a, a lot of people who, uh, because of the uh, limits on what they're allowed to do, have turned to astronomy as a, a newly discovered hobby. Sales of telescopes in the U.S. are way up. I'm not quite sure if we have the same situation here in Canada, but it's probably likely that uh, there is an increase. And so uh, we do need to be able to address the demand for those programs. So again, if you feel comfortable talking to youth online uh, about astronomy, we could certainly use your help in that regard. Uh, similarly with observing, um, uh, again, we are uh, limiting our involvement there to uh, individual meetups or individual observing. Uh, formal uh, observing programs are suspended for the moment. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to return to that in the not too distant future. Uh, a reminder that there's a lot of things going on uh, at the uh, national level. The uh, RESC uh, national organization has a lot of things being offered online. Uh, there's the speaker series, there's the uh, various presentations on exploring the um, Observer's Handbook. Uh, and uh, a shout out and congratulation to Blake Mancaro, uh, who um, has had his long running project on uh, a double star observing program uh, officially inaugurated at the RESC as an observing program, uh, where you can uh, earn a certificate as well as an observer's pin. Uh, it's taken Blake, I think he said seven years to put that together and get it uh, set up with the national organization. So uh, kudos to Blake and uh, thank you very much for all the work you've done over the years in encouraging Double Star Observing. Uh, this is really a, a great uh, achievement to have that uh, observing program recognized by the society. So again, lots of things that are going on on the uh, national level and they're all free as a benefit of your membership in the society. So uh, please make sure you take advantage of those programs. Uh, because of the pandemic, we've had to uh, close the CAO again. Uh, uh, we had a couple of months when people were able to go up there, uh, but unfortunately uh, we've had to shut it down again. Uh, in fact, uh, it's been uh, made uh, quite plain to us that uh, uh, people traveling into uh, areas outside of the GTA um, uh, are not particularly welcome because of the uh, risk of uh, virus transmission. So uh, we have to sort of stay home and the only people who are going up are members of the CAO committee to do necessary maintenance. Uh, we do have an additional complication in that uh, the areas that we have traditionally been using for winter parking uh, are no longer available to us and we are trying to come up with a solution for that. Uh, the pandemic certainly doesn't help, but again, we are working on trying to ensure that uh, winter observing and overnight stays at the CAO will be uh, possible uh, once the uh, pandemic emergency is ended. But in the meantime, I just ask you to be patient. Uh, we will eventually return to the CAO and have things going on. 
just not at this time. Uh, membership renewals are um, uh, starting to be sent out and um, uh, I'd like to remind you that many of you uh, members uh, have a renewal date in October or September because of the uh, way in which memberships used to be sold at the RASC. Um, and uh, we would uh, ask you to try and uh, renew your membership as early as possible so that uh, you don't lose contact and you maintain your uh, access to the various uh, online uh, facilities. Um, if you are having difficulties because of um, uh, loss of work and so on, uh, but would still like to maintain your membership in the society, uh, there is an emergency fund with uh, some uh, uh, limited subsidies to help uh, members in need. And that's something that you can uh, uh, look at from the uh, society. Just contact mempub at rasc.ca for information on accessing uh, the emergency fund uh, to help with your membership if you are in that kind of situation. I hope that the number of people affected that way is minimal, but uh, again, uh, the pandemic has had a huge effect in so many ways on members of our society um, and the society in general. Uh, another thing uh, that uh, we are trying to do in this time when we're not really uh, able to uh, do much uh, with the public is to try and organize things uh, to maintain the services and plan for uh, future when we can get back into operation. That means uh, we are looking for people who have some spare time who maybe can help us with our various uh, programs and activities. And uh, again, the RESC Toronto Centre, as well as the National Society, very much relies on members to volunteer their time uh, to help out with various activities. Um, you know, uh, the observatories, education and outreach, as I was mentioning before. And another important thing is, um, you know, our communications with members. And uh, Eric uh, Briggs has for many years been the uh, editor of Scope. And for, uh, uh, you know, uh, the last couple of years, he's been finding uh, his time is getting uh, really quite uh, busy. and. So he's indicated that he needs to step away from uh, uh, editing scope. So we are looking for somebody who can take over from him to organize the material uh, to produce the newsletter every other month uh, for members. And uh, if you do have some experience with uh, uh, organizing or writing newsletters and editing, uh, well, we could certainly use your help. So uh, again, uh, if you would like to get some more information about the job, uh, please contact volunteer at rasto.ca for more information. And we'll be happy to uh, uh, tell you all about it. Uh, again, SCOPE is one of the uh, ways that we contact all members of the organization. And so it is an important um, activity for us. Okay, that's it for tonight. Um, Thank you very, very much for participating in our YouTube uh, live stream. Uh, remember that this service uh, is um, a complimentary uh, uh, service uh, provided by the RSC Toronto Centre. Uh, we would very much like it if you aren't already a subscriber. If you would subscribe, please click on the uh, subscribe uh, symbol. And don't forget also to uh, click on the notification bell so that you'll be notified when uh, we uh, have uh, live streams scheduled to um, uh, be presented. Uh, again, it's one of those ni nice ways to keep in touch. And we'll look forward to seeing you online at future sessions. So again, thank you very much for participating in tonight's program. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Stay safe. Stay healthy, clear skies to you all. Good night.